Well, welcome to this video. I'm going to start off with a bit of a review of how the initial rollout of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine is going in the UK. Started yesterday, several million doses have been given already, so really quite encouraging stuff. Now, this is not the end. It's not even the uh, beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. I'm sorry about that Churchillian drama there, but it does kind of describe it really, because um, we've got a long way to go. We've got this winter to get through. Cases are so high in the United States, and indeed they're still high in Europe. The, uh, the community transmission is ongoing apace. And even when we've got the vaccines rolled out in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, the UK, we've still got about 5 million other people in the world are going to need vaccinated. So it's a bit of a long job still ahead. Um, but it is going to be good because we're going to review this. This is the first peer-reviewed information we have on this. But uh, let, let, let's just go on with the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine first, the Pfizer BioNTech. So we started this rollout yesterday. Now, this comes in these big uh, pizza box things to keep the minus, minus 70 degrees uh, centi Celsius that's required for transport. And then there's just over three days to get it out. So you've got batches of 975 vaccines that you have to give out. So this in itself has somewhat uh, dictated the way that this is being done. And it's being done from hospital hubs at the moment. So it's been given out in hospitals. People are being called into the hospital to receive the vaccine because we can't really be shipping it out or around the place yet because we're not sure about the cold chain logistics. So that is uh, what's happening. Um, so about three days to give out the 975 doses. Therefore, it's in hospital hubs. Now, so far, over 80s, NHS and care home staff have been uh, vaccinated. 70 hubs in the UK. And of course, that includes Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland with allocations of vaccine. The initial dose, the, the, <laughs> the initial dose, the initial volume we were given from, from the Belgian manufacturers 800,000 doses and next week we're expecting a further million doses from uh, from Belgium and in 2020 altogether we're expecting 5 million doses enough to vaccinate 2.5 million of the most vulnerable and most people that need this this vaccine most now if you're in the United States I'm expecting the um, the FDA Food and Drug Administration to uh, authorize the use of the Pfizer vaccine this Friday in a couple of days time and it will be rolling out Saturday. I think the latest date that vaccines will be getting given out in the United States will be Monday and probably before that. I would imagine there'll be some given out on Saturday. So that's encouraging. Now if you live in the European Union, as far as I've heard, the, uh, the European Medicines Agency is not meeting till the 29th of December. And after that, individual member states, all 27 of them, will have to decide how to proceed. Now, this delay is just bizarre, to be quite honest. The fact that the European Medicines Agency have not got their act together is just, it really quite beggars credulity that it's going to take them so long. But um, I suppose it means that most of the manufacturing is going to the UK at the moment. That's the one we're looking at later. Sorry about that. Five million doses by the end of 2020. And by that time, uh, the European Union countries won't even have started vaccinating. So the states will have been vaccinating for three weeks. The UK will have been vaccinating for four or five weeks. And then they'll get around to starting in Europe. Not a political comment, simply a matter of the facts as I understand them. Now, there's been two adverse reactions reported. Uh, to the vaccine in the UK from the thousands of doses that were given yesterday. Two adverse reactions. And these reactions are described as anaphylactoid reactions. Now, these are basically a form of allergic reaction. It's slightly different from an anaphylactic reaction because an anaphylactoid reaction is like an allergic reaction to something you have not been previously exposed to. But you can still get red, uh, itchy skin, you can get a drop in blood pressure, you can get an increase in heart rate. Um, and some, some people get swelling, uh, itchiness, did I say itchiness, that the blood pressure can drop. And some people that the bronchial passages can close down a bit and make uh, breathing difficult. All things that we are remarkably good at treating in hospitals. Now, I, I've been teaching, uh, giving medicines, intravenous medicines and 
vaccines for for decades now and uh, this is something that we talk about every single time we do this lesson this is nothing new this is well known well rehearsed territory some people uh, particularly people that are known as a topic um, can have adverse reactions to things although these people do seem to be uh, the, the people in this instance there's two of them uh, both had these anaphylactoid reactions both been treated both absolutely fine so both of the actions were shortly after the medicine they're both fine but this is the key thing they both had a history of serious allergic reactions and carry adrenaline pens what you call epi pens in the states um, uh, I won't start talking about those. There's been a lot of fuss about EpiPens and the cost of them. Um, so, so severe allergic patients not in the trial. So you might ask, well, why on the very first day that this vaccine has been given out, have we got two of these anaphylactoid reactions? The answer is because two members of NHS staff who know there are multiple allergic to things, who already carry adrenaline or EpiPens. In, in, in English, English, we say adrenaline. In American English, you say epinephrine. It's exactly the same thing. Um, and, and it's not surprising that these, these people have had these reactions. It, it, it's that they would react to many different things. So this does not concern me actually at all. Um, it doesn't surprise me and I'm, I'm not concerned about it. It sounds bad because you've got an adverse reaction to a new vaccine. But this is something we're well familiar with. We're well rehearsed. All of these uh, vaccinations have been given in hospitals where these things can be very readily treated and they both, they both were. So um, this is a common thing that we know about. Doesn't surprise me, doesn't really concern me. Uh, the media are making a bit of a huff, huff and puff about it, um, but, but I'm, not, I'm not concerned at all uh, at the moment uh, about that. Uh, Professor Stephen Powis, medical, uh, medical, not sure, big, big medical boss in the NHS. Uh, it's common with a new vaccine. The MHRA have advised on a precautionary basis that people with a significant history of allergic reaction do not receive this vaccine. Uh, after two people with a history of significant allergic reactions responded adversely. It doesn't surprise me at all. This is not remotely surprising and quite honestly not concerning. And Dr. June Rain, uh, a med, a MHRA, Medical Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority in the UK. It's only right to take this step now we've had this experience. So it makes sense. Let's, let's get more experience of the vaccine, then worry about vaccinating these people. Now, we do vaccinate people who are at high risk of allergic reactions. We just do it in an appropriate environment and, and we take care and we do it properly. So we can get around to that. It's not concerning me at all. Now, um, this what I want to look at now is this paper here. Now this paper here is the first peer-reviewed uh, paper that we have uh, ever on the um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. But it's not just the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, it's the first peer-reviewed paper on any uh, sars coronavirus 2 uh, vaccine. So it's a big deal because it's peer-reviewed. Now We've had information before from press releases, and that's all we've had. So, so um, Pfizer BioNTech a few weeks ago released a press release said said this vaccine looks good, but it was, it was just a press release. Now uh, the uh, lot, lots more rolling information has gone to the, the regulatory authorities, and they've passed this, and they're, 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 they'll still be getting information on a daily basis. So they have much more information than we have in the public domain. But this is all we've got in the public domain. So. We're going to have a quick look at it. Um, first peer-reviewed vaccine evidence. Safety and efficacy of their Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So, so, so that must be their uh, research code for the vaccine. We normally call it that AZD12222. Anyway, it's the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, not the Pfizer one that's being used now. That is already approved. Um, that's the original paper that I've just uh, flashed up on the screen. So Oxford University, replicant deficient chimpanzee adenovirus. Right, so this means that when it's given, this vaccine will not replicate inside the person that the vaccine is given to. The, uh, the viral vector will stick around for, I don't know, 24 hours and then be eaten by the body's immune system. Something like that. And it's a, it's a chimpanzee, 
Uh, it's an adenoviral vector. Now, adenoviruses are a common group of viruses, so-called because they were first identified from the adenoids, those glands next to you. Tonsils at the back of the throat, well, lymphoid tissue rather than glands to be more precise. Um, so that's what it is. Um, now, it contains the sars coronavirus 2 structural surface glycoprotein antigen. In other words, they've taken this uh, chimpanzee pretty harmless adenovirus and they put some DNA into this virus and that DNA actually codes for the, um, the spike protein that's what they've done so that's quite clever really and then they give this uh, they give this viral vector and then once this uh, this viral vector Imagine that's the viral particle there. Once that uh, chimpanzee adenovirus is in the body, it will produce these uh, glycoproteins. Now, glyco means to do with sugar or carbohydrate, and protein just means a protein. So these are a combination of carbohydrate and protein, in other words. Uh, uh, but these will be expressed on the surface of the viral vector cell. And because the DNA inside this viral vector is the DNA that produces the spike protein, this will have the same shape as the spike protein. That will then be recognized by the T cells of the immune system. And the T, the, the, the T cells will be able to destroy infected cells. And it will also be infected by, uh, recognized by the B cells, which will produce the antibodies. So that's the way it's working. Now, um, and I know this might cause a little confusion because I've said DNA. DNA, of course, is deoxyribonucleic acid. And we all know that the SARS coronavirus 2 is an RNA virus, ribonucleic acid. But DNA and RNA can both code for forming proteins. They can both code for forming proteins. So this is the code or the recipe for the same spike protein, but in DNA form, because the, uh, the adenovirus is a DNA virus, whereas the, um, the SARS coronavirus 2 is an RNA virus. So in other words, same recipe, slightly different way of presenting the recipe. That, that's all it is. Um, that, that's the way this vaccine works. And this is to evaluate the safety and efficacy. So th there's four ongoing blinded randomized controlled trials. Now, most of these are single blinded in that the people giving the vaccine know whether they're getting the vaccine or the placebo. Um, the patient doesn't know. But they're randomised, which of course is essential, and they're controlled, that they have a control group. This is the way research is done. You do, ideally, you do randomised double-blind control trials, publish it in the peer-reviewed literature. That's good. And actually, the, the, the paper that we have already, that we're taking this from, has already been... Um, modified by the peer reviewers quite a bit. The peer reviewers told them to put extra information in and they did. Uh, so it's a better paper already because of the peer review process. But of course, it's now being peer reviewed, not by just, I don't know, maybe a dozen peer reviewers in the first instance. Now it's been reviewed by th thousands of peer reviewers all around the country. It's been reviewed by me, not that I would count myself a peer with these great scientists, but um, it makes, it looks like a good, good paper to me. Um, so it's being reviewed by everyone now. Studies were done uh, UK, Brazil, South Africa. Participants were over 18. Now, this is true for all of the vaccines so far. We only know about what they're doing in, in young people. Uh, sorry, in, in, in people over the age of 18. We don't know about adult. We don't know about children and uh, teenagers yet. Um, that day, th those trials are still to come. Um, anyway, the, the, they were randomly allocated to... Um, the control group or the um, vaccination group on a one-to-one -one basis, meaning you get the same number of people in both groups. Now, the, the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine, that was actually uh, the placebo in the control group in the Pfizer vaccine was actually salty water. Uh, in, in the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which we're reviewing now, they used another vaccine. So they were comparing a vaccine with a vaccine. So quite, quite a clever move, really. And the vaccine they were using was a meningococcal group uh, conjugated uh, vaccine. 
or some people were given saline, but most were given this meningococcal vaccine. So meningococcus is a bacteria that causes meningitis, obviously, and can cause sepsis as well as fact. And, and when it's con conjugated means that there's, it, it's vaccinated against a few different potential uh, meningitis causing bacteria. Anyway, it's a standard recognized vaccine that they were comparing the new vaccine against. So when we say the vaccine group, we mean the group that had the SARS coronavirus 2 vaccine. That's what we mean. So the plan was that they got two doses of 50 billion viral particles each, and that is the standard dose. So they got uh, 50 billion of these, um, th these, these chimpanzee adenoviruses. Carrying the genetic information to make the spike protein for the SARS coronavirus 2, which will be expressed once it's in the body, which will be recognized by our immune system, therefore generating the immunities to the SARS coronavirus 2. Now, a substantial subset in the UK trial had half dose as their first dose. That's the lo lower dose. So, so there was a post, most of, most of them got uh, 50 billion doses. Uh, some only got, uh, actually, it was, it was actually 22 billion doses or viral particles that they got. So it was about half strength. So 22 billion instead of 50 billion viral particles. Um, now the infections were recorded uh, 14 days after the second dose. So what they did was uh, they gave thousands of people the, uh, the, the active vaccine against SARS coronavirus 2. They gave thousands of other the, uh, the control vaccine against meningococcal bacterial infections which does not have an action as far as we know against against SARS coronavirus 2 and then they waited for them to get infected and someone counted as an infection if they got an infection 14 days after the second dose whether it was the control group or whether it was the uh, the active vaccine group all standard all good quality research techniques now the cutoff for data for this paper was the 4th of November so the, the total data was collected from the 23rd of April to the 4th of November. Now, it's important to know that the regulatory authorities, for example, in the UK, we're expecting a decision on this, this um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. In the next week or two, I would think they have much more up to date information. So the public domain peer reviewed information goes up to the 4th of November. The information they're getting will go up to the 9th of December as of now, 10th of December tomorrow. Um, so they're more up to date than we are. Uh, 24,000 participants enrolled, uh, 11,636 participants, 7,548 in the UK, 4,088 in Brazil. We've got preliminary interim data from. So this is what this is from. This is from these people who had that vaccine or entered the trial in those countries. Now, of this group, of, the, of this 11,636 participants, 131 caught the infection. 131 caught it. 14 days after the last dose of the vaccine or the control meningococcal vaccine. So that's how many actually got it. And um, so we actually ended up with two protocols. There was the low dose standard dose. So some people in the UK got the 22 billion viral particles first, followed by the dose of 50 billion viral particles. And others got the dose of 50 billion viral particles, followed by a second dose of 50 billion viral particles. So we actually ended up with two groups. Now, the reason that some people got the lower dose, the 22 billion viral particles in the UK, was a way in in the manufacturing of this it's quite difficult sometimes and there's different techniques to decide how many viral particles you're actually going to get so th that was just a, a manufacturing blip really um, but it looks like it's turning out to be quite a fortunate blip um, and i hope advantage is going to be taken of the information we're going to look at so what was the result right so in the vaccine group taking the people that got the the, uh, the lower dose and the standard dose and the standard dose and the standard dose. What happened in the vaccine group was um, eligible for data collection, 5,807 people. 30 of those got COVID-19 infection. So 5,807 people given the vaccine, 
to SARS coronavirus 2, 30 infections. The control group who weren't given the SARS coronavirus 2 vaccines, well, there was a similar number of those. There was 5,829 data reported on, and there was 101 cases in those. So we can see that there are more infections in the control group than there are in the vaccine group, indicating the vaccine is working. 30 cases who got the vaccine, 101 cases who did not get the vaccine. And the statisticians worked that out at an efficacy of 70.4% overall, is how they worked that out. Um, now, the standard dose, standard dose, the, the, in other words, the larger dose, the 50 billion dose followed by the followed by the 50 million dose. Uh, now, in the vaccine group there, there was 27 cases and in the control group, there were 71 cases. So vaccinated people got 27 infections, unvaccinated people got 71 infections, and that gives you an efficacy of 62.1%. And in the UK, it was 60.3% and in Brazil, it was 64.2% indicating that that is probably accurate data because it was replicated the result was replicated in two continents always nice if you can replicate the the information um, now the lower dose the ones that got the lower dose first the 22 billion viral particles as opposed to the 50 billion viral particles so they got the lower dose as the first injection and then they got the standard dose of 50 billion viral particles as the second injection now, the vaccine group, there was three infections from 1,367 people. And in the control group, there was 30 infections from 1,374 people. So this was the subgroup in the UK. Relatively small numbers, but that gave a vaccine efficiency of uh, efficacy of 90%. So looking very much like giving a lower dose first and then giving a higher dose second is much more efficacious. Now there were slight issues in this that the people that got the lower dose first were mostly younger just by the way of the, the rollout of the trial. But even, even so what they found out was and this is really quite important is that this low dose followed by the high dose group had less asymptomatic infections. Now, one of the things about this trial, especially in the UK, is as well as asking people to report in if they got symptoms, so they could be assessed if they got symptoms, they actually did um, regular follow-ups using antigen testing on about 7,000 people in the UK study. So they were able to pick up asymptomatic infections as well as symptomatic infections. So it's quite clever, it involves a lot of monitoring. And what they found was that those who had the lower dose followed by the higher dose, they had less asymptomatic infections as well. So not only did they get less symptomatic illness, they had less asymptomatic illness, indicating that this idea of giving the lower dose followed by the higher dose is a genuine effect because there's less symptomatic infections. Now, you don't need me to tell you that if there's less symptomatic infections, that's got implications for ongoing contagion. Because the reason we have a pandemic is there's so many people that are asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic that are spreading the virus. But if giving the lower dose followed by the higher dose reduces the amount of asymptomatic infections, as it did quite significantly, I think it was about a 30 or 40 percent reduction in asymptomatic infections, then that means there's going to be less spread of the virus. That's great. And they also found that a longer gap between the two doses was probably going to help. Most people in, in this study, the, dose, the, the gap between the first dose and the second dose was four weeks. Uh, in in the, the Pfizer vaccine that's already been authorised, it was three weeks. Here it's a bit longer and there were some indications that it might be longer. And um, 21 days after the, uh, after the, from 21 days after the first dose. Now, this is, means that the immunity is kicking in. Bef that there's some level of immunity before the second dose has been given. Now this is actually quite common with vaccination that you give one dose and you get a level of immunity. And then very often the second dose is to give you a longer acting immune response. 
But of course, we don't know that with SARS coronavirus 2 because we haven't had enough time yet. <laughs> but here's the key point. Uh, 21 days after the first dose, there were 10 cases hospitalised for COVID-19. Two were classified as severe and there was one death. But all of those were in the non-vaccinated control group. All of them. So in the vaccine group, the group that were vaccinated, there were no hospitalizations. There were no cases that were classified as severe and no one died. Whereas in the group that got the placebo, there was 10 hospitalized infections, two classified as severe and one person died. So that means really that the vi this vaccine is 100% efficient the efficacy is actually 100% in terms of preventing severe COVID infection, hospitalizations and death. And of course, that's remarkably important. I don't mind too much if I get a very mild viral illness. I don't want a severe one. I certainly don't want to be hospitalized and I certainly don't want to die. And it looks like this vaccine is protecting me against all of those things. So that is really a pretty impressive finding. And this is why... Uh, combined with the safety data we're going to look at. I'm pretty sure this vaccine is going to be authorised soon. And it's great because we've got 100 million doses in the UK. I think a couple hundred, two, three hundred million doses for Europe. Um, I think the United States has booked about 100 million doses and it can be made all over the place and it costs about three dollars um, a shot. It's, it's really, really cheap. So this is the, probably the vaccine that's going to, most of the people in the world are going to end up getting. Um, Safety wise, we've got 74,000 person months so far followed up at the end to the end of this study. 175 severe adverse events in 168 patients. There were 80 events in the vaccine group and 91% in the control group. So people reported adverse events, but when it was looked at, there was no more adverse events in the vaccine group than in the control group. So it's looking like this vaccine, that, that people are actually given the vaccine, is as safe as the controls, which is the key thing about safety. Because obviously people are going to get ill anyway. I mean, I think there was actually four people in this study had died. Um, now, one was, one was killed in a, in a road traffic accident. Um, one was actually murdered. I think that was in Brazil, although that wasn't released. Really, it was actually a homicide. One was killed by blunt trauma and one died of some, some other unrelated condition. So people are going to get sick and people are going to die in, when we're looking at such large numbers. But the, these were adjudicated not to be caused by the, not to be caused by the vaccine. It's fairly, fairly obvious if someone has a road traffic accident or is murdered, um, it's not caused by the, the vaccine. So you do get these events. This is why we have a control group, of course, to compare it to. So 84 events in the vaccine group, 91 events in the placebo group. So we can see that there's no more adverse events in the vaccine group, indicating vaccine safety, which is the key thing. Um, three possible events were uh, classified as possibly be related to the vaccine. Uh, one in the vaccine group and one in the control group, because remember the control group also got a vaccine. And we're not saying there's no risk with vaccines. Of course we're not. There's always a risk, some risk. It's a case of the benefits outweigh the risk, which they do seem to do massively in this case. The third case, we're not given the information as to what group they were in. So there we have that. Um, Peer-reviewed information showing uh, good degrees of efficacy, ways that efficacy could be, in could be increased. Basically, the vaccine is appearing to be safe of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. That's why I'm expecting that to be approved by the, uh, the British regulatory authorities uh, in the next few weeks, actually. I'm expecting that to be approved. Right, we're looking at a few pictures that you've sent in of your experience of the pandemic. So these are from Jane in California. Good, social distancing six feet or two meters in European measurements. Obviously on a notice board somewhere. Blanked out chairs. It's not so much the 
blanking out of chairs that uh, I find encouraging. Uh, well, no, it's good, but what I don't find encouraging is these doors are shut. You know, is there a lot of point with the social distancing if it's in a stuffy environment? Yes, there is some point, but there's less point. We need the ventilation as well. It's the one that people often are not getting. But thank you for that. Uh, from California, what's this? Oh, more various aspects of education. Again, looks like it's in a, in a public uh, information setting. So, so that's good. So that they were from, um, who were they from? Jane in California. Now, John in Texas. Again, this is John's, uh, what's caught his eye. And um, this is a outside a music venue and there's two skips just now uh, with rubbish in that don't seem to be very full um, but a few months ago there was lots of skips of rubbish in indicating uh, much less uh, activity so no, it's just things that show how the pandemic is for you okay that is us for today uh, if your name's Mary and you live in Dublin uh, you know who you are thank you for what you've uh, done a kind thing for me thank you for that and uh, and bless you, thank you. Um, and I think that's all for today. Um, I think I think that's long enough for now. So th th thanks for watching. As always, be in great hope. These vaccines are working. I mean, back in back in January, February, March, April, it wasn't clear it was going to work. We don't have a vaccine for malaria. We don't have a vaccine for human immunodeficiency virus. After trying for decades spending billions of dollars on it. But here we've, we've got these vaccines. The, this SARS coronavirus 2 seems to be highly amenable to um, uh, vaccine production. So again, although this pandemic's bad, it's another aspect where we've been fortunate. We've been fortunate and it, it will get rid of this pandemic, I believe. And life will be back to normal for most of us by next uh, next late summer early winter the rest of the world is going to take longer to roll out so optimistic but remember it's not quite the end yet not quite the uh the beginning of the end but we're hopeful it's the end of the beginning <laughs>